I want you to open your Bibles. Actually, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to jump to uh, Daniel chapter 9 for a moment, and then I'm going to go into this uh, message on, uh, on angels. And we'll be talking about angels tonight. I don't know about you, but I like talking about angels. But I saw something tonight as I was getting ready on this message on angels. I saw something that also stirred up something that I feel is very important in the region and in, in the dimension here in this area in Keller. And something that we need to take for, forefront in spiritual warfare. And understand that this is an incredible strategy of spiritual warfare. I want you to look at Daniel. I don't think anybody denies that Daniel was a mighty man of God. Okay, this is, this is the guy... Okay, in the lion's den, this is the guy that stood up. This is the guy that prayed when it was ordered not to pray. This is the man that ate only certain things when, the, you know, the king's men tried to get him to do something different. This is, the, this is a man of prayer and of righteousness. And I want you to hear Daniel's prayer that was so pivotal to releasing breakthroughs into the entirety of the children of God. Verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of, and this is Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, in the son of somebody, it sounds like I'm sneezing, Ashishirus. (laughs) God bless you. Uh, Of the seed of Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chandeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by by books the number of the years Whereof the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, first thing I want to put in your spirit is Daniel was now ready to go into intercession based upon prophetic words that had been previously released. He was taking them up before God. The prophetic words previously released. Daniel was taking him up and saying, listen, I believe that this is the season right now. And he said, I set my face unto the Lord to seek my prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. And the thing that it started catch has caught me here over the years with this is Daniel, this righteous man of God, man of prayer and commitment, did not have a problem identifying, associating, and taking on corporate responsibility for the sins of the children of Israel. He didn't say, they have sinned. He said, we have sinned. Are you, this is hugely important. He didn't say, they have sinned. He said, we have sinned. I am choosing to be identified with your people even in their sin and rebellion, because I'm standing in the gap as one of the members of that body, and I'm taking responsibility and confessing the sin, because I know that's what needs to happen. And so often we're in a day, we're like, well, they did this wrong, and they did this wrong, and look at them, and look at them. And God is looking for a prophetic praying people that will stand before Him Believing the promises and being willing to say, but hey, Lord, you know, we, have, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity. Let's go on. He said, he said we have sinned. Where, 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 what verse am I on? Verse 5, okay. <coughs> oh, I, we're scolded. Right. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, woo, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day the men of Judah 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near, and to they that are far. I'm reading from the King James Version. Let me jump over to the New King James here. Uh, to the Lord belong a, a verse 9. Let's go to verse 9. Am I, where am I at? Is that verse 8? Verse 8. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our king, to our kings, to our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongeth mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Listen, to the Lord belongs mercy and forgiveness. This is all, the power of this is in your hands, even though we have rebelled. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which we, he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as to not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his word, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing us up upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. So he's saying, listen, we, you, you said all this disaster, you told us it was coming, and we still, we have not turned. But somebody is turning. <laughs> therefore the Lord has, verse 11, or 14, therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem. I mean, he's like saying, you are just to do this. You are righteous to do this. We have disobeyed. We have rebelled. And he's taking responsibility. He's not saying those sluggards over there, those heathen. He said us. But you are righteous. You are just. But turn away your anger. According to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, O oh God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Not for us, God, but for your sake. I, I am standing before you. I'm confessing our sins. I'm repenting of our sins. But God, come and visit your people for your name's sake. Not for our sake. We're deserving of this judgment. But you are righteous and you are full of mercy. And that your name, and he goes on to talk about, listen, you chose your people. You brought them out of the land of Egypt. You made yourself a name in, in all the world by what you performed in the children of Israel. You made yourself a great name. Now, don't let your name be continued to be reproached because we have messed up so much. But turn our hearts back. Come back to us. Restore Jerusalem. Bring your glory back to your place so that your name may be great. There is two really empower, powerful points in here. One is his willingness to confess and repent and identify with the sins of the people of God. And two is to call upon God to restore his glory, not because we're so deserving, but because his name is worthy of being glorified. Do it for your name's sake. Don't let your name be reproached. Don't let people point at us in our weakness, in our failure, in our bondage, and bring accusation against you. 
We deserve this, but God turned from that. Remember your covenant. Remember your promises and send your glory once again that your name may be glorified. There is such power here and lack of accusation against the body of God's people, but a recognition of the sin, a recognition of the rebellion, but a willingness to repent of it and cry out for mercy for all people. He wasn't looking for a personal revival. He was looking for a national revival. Because the are y'all hearing me? See, a lot of times we're saying, oh, God, send your glory, send your power, anoint me or anoint our little group because it kind of elevates us, you know. And be, there's something about, man, we just love revival spirit to be here and people lined up like they were at Brownsville out the door and down the street. No, it would be so exciting to be a part of that because it kind of has a way of making us feel like we're important and making us feel like we're spiritual. But Daniel had tapped in. He said, this is not about me, God. It's not about my name. It's about your Jerusalem. It's about your glory. Do this. We don't deserve it. Come on. Amen. Come on. Let's be honest here. The church in America does not deserve an end time outpouring of his spirit, but God's going to do it in America, not because of us. He's going to do it that his name is made great, that he is glorified. There's something about praying this way that breaks the power of the enemy. Because when your focus is the exalt, purely and truly the exaltation of Christ and not the exaltation of yourself, not the exaltation of your little sect or whatever, but it's the exaltation of Christ, it breaks strongholds of the enemy that withhold the move of God. He prayed this. Now verse 20. This is powerful. Now while I was speaking. Praying. And confessing. My sin. Notice he said his. But we just heard when he was praying. It was all about the corporate. But he took such honors. For confessing my sin. And the sin of my people Israel. And presenting my supplications Before the Lord my God. For the holy mountain of my holy God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, the angel, ever say the angel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. <laughs> At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. Woo! Sometimes you start praying and you confess and you're asking God for this and you're thinking, oh man, but I don't, it's nothing's happening, nothing's happening. No, no, no. God's saying at the beginning of this kind of supplication, the command will go out <laughs> because God loves mercy and his name is going to be glorified. We go on and he gives this incredible understanding and then we go into Daniel chapter 10 and there Daniel prays the 21 days and Gabriel shows up again and he talks about that the prince of Persia was resisting him and, he was, and that continual prayer broke through that demonic stronghold. But it was in this kind, what caught my attention was the kind of prayer and it released the power of angels. Because angels are here to help. They're much more involved in our everyday Christian walk than we realize. Psalm 91 Let's do verse 11 through 13. I got a lot of scripture, so I hope I can get through some, most of this. For he shall, everybody say shall. And there, there's not, a, there's not a, a question mark in there. There's a shall. 
He shall give his angels charge over you. To do what? To keep you in all your ways. That is to protect you. That is to defend you. That is to fight for you. That is to guard you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody say, I got angels that are going to keep me. Uh, you ever feel like, man, I, this, this thing's hitting me and I'm getting hit and buffeted and I don't know what to do? You just start being, no, 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 I got angels keeping me. Woo! God. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands, they shall bear you up. They're going to hold you up. Lest you dash your foot against a stone, you shall tread. Now, this is in context of the angels strengthening you and the angels upholding you and the angels keeping you. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Woo! <laughs> Say, devil, you're going down. Somebody said, devil, you are going down. You are going down. He's given his angels charge over me. You might not feel like it, but you might not. In fact, Daniel even goes on in the next vision, and he talks about, or he talks about how utterly weak he was. How he, he was, he, in the experience, that he was so weak, and, and the angel came and strengthened him. And he thanked the angel. Now, now, now I can hear what you have to say. You've strengthened me. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so weakened by the battle. And the Bible says that the angels came down and ministered unto him. The Bible speaks about Jesus in the, in the, in the, in, um, in the wilderness under temptation that the angels of God ministered unto him. If Jesus Christ himself needed angels to minister to him when he was here on the earth, how much more so do you and me? And we can expect it. I like what he says uh, in, in the Amplified, in Psalm 91, verse 11, in the Amplified. For he will give his angels a special charge over you to accompany and defend and preserve you in all your ways of obedience and service. Shakarava <laughs> Sunday. Somebody say, I got angels. <sighs> I remember this experience I had many years ago in my house. And this wonderful prophetess from New Zealand was visiting. And she was saying, well, let me, she want to pray for me. And, and she gave a prophetic word. And she said, how was that? And I said, that's great. That was powerful. I said, I think there's more. She was like, oh, okay. So she prayed a little more. And she gave another part of the word. She said, oh, that's, that's, she said, how was that? I said, oh, that's powerful, but I think there's more. I was pulling on it, man. I was pulling on it. You know, she was a powerful prayer warrior. Incredible church in, in New Zealand. This is before House of Prayer had come up or anything. That they, they hired her full time just to pray. Woo, glory to God. I know, I know there's some people that say, well, I'd like that job, and they want to pray like 30 minutes a day. No, <laughs> you know, no, no, no. But she, she, this lady was, I mean, lived in the prayer closet. So she started praying the third time. And when she started praying the third time, she's praying. And, and, and I felt this presence come up. I felt an angel come up behind me. And he put his, I was sitting down on the couch. And he put his hands on my shoulders behind me. And it was like kneeling down. But I could feel he was big. And she gave this prophetic word. And she said, how was that? And I said, I just have one question. She said, what is that? I said, who is he? And she said, who? I said, him. And she went, oh! Because like her, she said her eyes were suddenly open. She said, oh. And he was so close to me. I felt, and I felt it was weird. Because I had had some angelic experiences before. But I felt love coming from him. And I thought, that's strange. And the other thing I felt was, he has always been there. He shall give his angels charge over you. From the beginning. <laughs> and I thought, he has always been there. 
And then I thought about all the bad stuff I had done before. I said, oh, Lord, he had always been there. <laughs> I, I, there, was a bit of a, there was a bit of like, oh, my, he saw it all. <laughs> Yeah, some of you lived like a perfect life, but for those of us who were good heathens, we were like, oh, my. he was, and, and I said, and so I said, who is he? And she went, oh, she said, he's the one that's always been with you, but that's after I felt it. I said, yeah, I was like, what do I do now? She said, I think you need to go be by yourself for a little bit. I was, yeah, that's a good idea. So I kind of walk upstairs, and I could feel him following me, and it was just like, well, this is freaky. And I go into my bedroom, and I lay down, and I could see him, not like I see you, but I see him in the spirit so clearly. And I lie on my bed, and he comes over to the side of my bed, and he kneels down, and I could see and feel the love, but I could see the love in his eyes. And he said, I have always been with you, and I have always loved you. And I was a little freaked out because I'm like, I don't want to go you know, kooky kooky. And so I literally said to the angel, I, I said it out loud. I said, I said, I don't mean to offend you, but I have to ask the father, is this okay? Y'all looking at me strange. So I said, father, is this okay? And the father spoke to me right there. He said, yes, it's okay. And I said, why, why am I needing to have this experience? And then immediately I I'm standing on a platform overseas, and I'm doing a crusade, and there are people in the meeting that are there to kill me. And I see, but they can't do anything. And I see this angel standing next to me with a huge sword drawn. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, there are places I'm going to send you that you're going to need to know who it is that's standing by your side. Woo! Okay, I... That's okay. I get it. All right. I understand this experience and why we need to have this. And I'm, why we need to understand that they're there, whether you see them or not. Somebody say he gave his angels charge over me. So let me give you quickly eight things that, that angels do. And this is not a complete list. Because I found, I, after I did the eight things, I found another list of 18. And I said, all right, I just got to deal with the eight. Number one, angels minister to the physical needs of God's children. Angels minister to the physical needs of God's children. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 from the Amplified. Are not the angels all ministering spirits, servants, sent out in the service of God for the assistance of those who are to inherit salvation? Wow. First Kings chapter 19, verse 5. Beginning with verse 5. Speaking of Elijah. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. Are you seeing this? Elijah had just been running from Jezebel. He's terrified. He's exhausted. He fell asleep. An angel wakes him up and had prepared a meal for him. Have you ever really, have you thought about it? Where did the, a baked cake happen in the middle of nowhere? Okay, this was not like, you know, delivery service from a, I mean, this was what it was. It was angelic delivery service, you know. Cook, I bet you that was one good tasting cake. <laughs> cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And when he went in the strength of that food, and he went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights. Do you want, that was some cake. I mean, he goes from being exhausted 
to getting two meals delivered by an angel, and it can last 40 days in strength. Man, oh man, I want that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. This is what I refer to with Jesus after the temptation. Then the devil left him, Jesus, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And then Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Give you a lot of verses. Luke chapter 22, verse 43. Luke 22, verse 43. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Look at this. He's, 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 in, ag this, he's in prayer, in agony. An angel strengthens him so that he can pray even more earnestly. Woo! <laughs> Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. The, that prayer, that intensity of prayer was only possible because an angel came and physically strengthened him. Are, are y'all seeing this? Whew. Number two, we went over this, but we're going to hit it again. Angels are charged to protect those who follow the Lord. And that's Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. In stream of that, the third one I put down is angels protect God's servants from their enemies. <laughs> I, I was out... Uh, at a more surreal conference, and I think it was 1988. And we were in this conference, and we were just all fired up. So between sessions, we would go out on the streets and evangelize. And that was, it was in Anaheim, and at that time, believe it or not, but the streets surrounding Anaheim were full of prostitutes. Because there was convention centers there, and it was, even though it was around Disney, it was full of prostitutes during the day. And we had seen this cop, a police officer, kind of, you know, questioning this lady and this, this prostitute, and, uh, you know, he didn't arrest her, but he was questioning her and trying to keep her in line, and so after he left, we thought, oh, we'll go witness to her, so we go up to her, and she was so mad at us, get away from me, get away from me, screaming, I mean, just demonized, she reached around, grabbed a bottle, broke the bottle, so it had the charred glass, and just broke the bottle, and just looked right at me, and came swinging at me, ah! and swung her hand just like this, I mean, full force. And she went, ah, ah, ah. She couldn't move her arm. And I'm sitting there going, go, angel, go. Angel was literally protecting from my enemy. The enemy, the enemy this, this woman was trying to attack me. And that's happened more than once where the angels have literally protected. Woo. In fact, the Lord spoke to me one time. I've almost never shared this. He said, son, there are places I'm going to send you in the world. He told me this, he told me this years ago. He said, son, you are going to have global influence, but in some ways, your ministry is always going to be small. He said, you're going to have huge global influence, but in some ways, your ministry is always going to be small. He said, because I'm going to send you into places under the radar. You're going to go in, set off spiritual explosions, and get out before anybody knows what happened. That's what he told me. He, and he literally said, he said, he said, I can't do that with more Cirillo, and I can't do that with Benny Hinn because they're so visible. He said, but I've got to have people like you. He said, it's going to have huge and huge global impact, but in some ways, your ministry is always going to be small. Are you all hearing? See, we think we have to have this big mega thing in order to have huge impact. No, you just got to have a big mega God. <laughs> and then he showed me, he said there will literally be times when they will come after you. And just like Jesus, I almost never shared this with anybody. So we're, we're, we're whoo. He said, but he showed me this. He said, there'll be times they will you, they will literally be come after you. They, they come, the, the authorities, the enemy, whoever they are, they're coming after you. And you will literally just walk right through their midst, and they won't see you. Because that's exactly what happened to Jesus. 
when they put Jesus up against the precipice, right? And literally, then all of a sudden, he, he just, they, he walked to their midst and like, where did he go? He was right there. Hallelujah. I, you say, what do you think happened? I, well, I, we're going to get into it here in a, a moment. I, I think the angels literally blinded them. In fact, all right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. And when the servant, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to them, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he, he said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that me he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses, angels on horses, and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Woo! Glory to God. Matthew 26, verse 53. Jesus, or do you not, or do you think? That I could not now, Jesus speaking, pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. That's thousands and thousands and thousands. Legions, what, 2,000? Is that right? Yeah, how many? How many was it say? What? Lord Jesus, I didn't know that. Tw oh, oh, 12, so it's 12, that's more than 80,000, 12 legions. So a legion is, divide that by 12. It's a lot. Like 6,000, 6,200 or something is a legion. 80,000. Oh, here it says generally a legion is 10,000 troops. Rojan legions in Jesus' time were around 6,000 troops. I actually wrote myself a note. It helps to read on. Lot at, so at Sodom. Genesis 19, 10 and 11. But the angels, they say the men, but the angels that were in the house reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Now, remember, what happened is the angels had showed up. Lot brought them in the house. Then all these perverts from Sodom and Gomorrah came out. They came out, pounding on Lot's door, said, give us those men that we may lay with them, that we may rape them, that we may have sex with them. Because that was the beauty and attractiveness of these angels. And, uh, and Lot's saying, no, no, no. And then the angels reach out, and they yank Lot in past the door. These men are going to kill Lot. And they struck, the angels struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness. Both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. <laughs> I mean, they're at the door. Where is, we can't say, where did the door go? Oh, this is real stuff, church. Hallelujah. I think we should start believing God for this kind of involvement. Because I think we're going to see more angelic involvement in the end times. They are so engaged and involved. We're not praying to angels and asking angels this. We pray to God, and God dispatches the angels. But they are his ministering spirits unto us. Angels deliver, again in the same stream, God's servants from peril and evil. Acts chapter 5, verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, and they brought them out, brought Peter and John out of the prison. An angel opened, that's cool. Hallelujah. Angel goes in, pops the door open. Come on, let's go. Now, isn't it interesting? We see it in the Bible, but we also see in history different stories about times that angels will show up and they'll literally deliver people out of situations, and then they'll tell them, now get out there, now run. Now go, you know, just, you know, it's, it's like, and, and I've, the stories of, then the angel will, will get them out of the, the, the dangerous point and then leave. But they got them out. <laughs> Glory to God. Acts chapter 12, verses 8 through 11. Then the angel said, just in case you thought this was old Old Testament stuff, and the angel said, and the angel, an angel spoke to Paul, and the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. 
So he went out and followed him and did not know that what, what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Isn't that interesting? And when they were past the first and the second guard posts, so I think God struck these guards with blindness, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. <laughs> so they passed the first guard coast, and, and, and then the iron gate just pops open. Okay, this is, I mean, Harry Potter, you ain't got nothing on this, all right? <laughs> I mean, this is cool, you know. <laughs> the Iron Gate. Pot. Maybe you guys aren't. I'm enjoying this. This this is like encouraging to me. Okay, <laughs> and it pops open, which opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angels departed for him. I get you past the guards. I get past the gates. Get you one block. I'm out of here. No, you. <laughs> you got it from here. Oh, it was, it was Peter, not Paul. And Peter, when Peter had come to himself, he said, oh, <laughs> it ain't a dream. It ain't a vision. This really just happened. Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. I, I mean, I have a hard time getting my head around this. You know, it's like you're having this experience, and it's so surreal that you don't even know it is real until the angel leaves you, and you're going, oh, it happened. Dr. Morris Rillo shares the story about how God saved him in the Jewish Orthodox orphanage when he was just 14 years of age, and the orphanage... Uh, rabbis found out about it and they would every night take him down into the basement and beat him to get him to renounce Jesus and he wouldn't and during a snowstorm a blizzard he they brought they were bringing him downstairs again and he's just said I'm not doing this anymore no more and he just started walking towards the front door and they just let him go because it's a blizzard outside. He had no coat. There's no, he's not going to go anywhere. But he walks out on the street, gets out there on the street corner, and it snows blowing. He's freezing. He has no coat. And he gets out there. They don't chase him because they figure he's going to come right back. And he sits there and he just starts crying. And he says, God, if you're real, God, if you're real. And he said, all of a sudden, a warmth came around him. And an angel on either side came and lifted up his arms. And begun to walk him down the street. And he just closed his eyes. It's these angels. That closed his eyes and he sang these Jewish songs of praise to God. As he walked down the street and walked down for several miles in a blizzard. Never opening his eyes. Just, just walking down the street. And then all of a sudden when he stopped, at one, they stopped him at one corner and the angels left. And he cried out, oh, where are you? And he turned around. And the little, little dear woman who had worked at the orphanage that led him to the Lord that had gotten fired was standing on that street corner because God had told her to go out in the blizzard on that street corner and wait. And he shows up. And as soon as they get together, the angels left. <laughs> Hallelujah. Peter said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. My God, Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. <laughs> Woo. Five. Angels encourage God's servants in hardship and seeming danger. Acts chapter 27, verse 23 and 24. Acts 27, verse 20. Is this all right? I'm giving you guys a lot of words tonight. This is good. For there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord, 
to whom, uh, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Because there was a storm going on and God had delivered them all. But the angel came to strengthen him and to encourage him in the face uh, uh, of that hardship and that danger of that storm on that ship. There's a lot of this. <laughs> Is that right? Angels reveal God's purposes to his servants. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 and through 13, and then we'll jump to verse 18. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. Then an angel, every say an angel, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And then in verse 18, And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered, Don't question an angel. And the angel <laughs> said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute. Because I can't, I can't handle, I got to make sure you know God's speaking some doubt and unbelief. <laughs> so you're going to be mute. And I, that's a whole other message. Until, and not be able to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Angels show God's servants what to do. Not only deliver a message of what God is doing, but he shows them what to do. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. This is Joseph. Saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take your, to take, to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The angel gave instructions. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Matthew chapter 2. Verse 19 and 20. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the, ch your, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Guys, I'm not dead. <laughs> Lord, I'm telling you. You say, why are you preaching on this? Because I believe we're entering into a day and a season of much more intensified angelic involvement. And I think we need to raise our level of faith. Stop riding, walking in such doubt and unbelief. And well, I just that's just for the few special, special. I'm showing you it's all over Scripture. And it was so many. This was much more common than we realize. And I really believe in my heart of hearts, it is going to be much more common. And that we need to have our faith level open and aware and sensitive. I don't want to be like I preached on Sunday. I don't want to be <clears throat> like Jacob saying, I was at the very gate of God, the very house of God, and did not know it. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make 830. I'm going to make it. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go, go towards the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. He told him where to go. Acts chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. On about, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. 
And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with, with, with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. This is pretty cool. He will tell you what you must do. So the angel shows up to Cornelius, says, Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now send some men down to Joppa to find this guy, Simon, and Simon's going to come and tell you what to do. Why did the angel tell him? Because we, cause it's a process too. Because God left the preaching up to us. <laughs> I've many, many, many times we sit here in the Muslim world, people talking about they're having the dream of the man in white, of the man in white, of the man in white. But very often in these experiences, if they're having the dream of the man in white, that they, they come out and they'll see Christians. That I, I know a friend, it was in Turkey. She was in Turkey. And a lady that I know, and she was just walking down the street, and a Muslim walked up to her and said, said, you know about the man in white. And she said, what are you talking about? I had a dream, and a man in white appeared to me, and he showed me your face and said, you could tell me who he is. <laughs> <Woo. clears throat> when Jesus comes back, he will send his angels. To gather the elect. <laughs> and I didn't put this one down there. But if you remember the story. About. Uh, Lazarus the poor man Lazarus. Right. Remember the story in the Bible says when he died. That the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. Matthew 24 verse 31. And Benjamin, if you'll come on up, that would be helpful. When he sent his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Huh. Could it be? I don't know what that exactly is going to be like. But could it be that in the rapture that it's angels lifting us up? I don't know. I don't know literally. I, they're they're going to gather. They're going to gather. It says they're going to gather from one of the heavens to the other. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 through 43, he said, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. So the, so the, the angels are even going to separate the wicked from the righteous and will cast them into the furnace of fire. So the angels in the end time, in the great white throne judgment seat, when the judgments come down, and there's a lake of fire, the angels are literally carrying the wicked into the lake of fire, into the furnace of fire, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 13, 49 and 50. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth. Separate the wicked from among the just. And cast them into the furnace of fire. And there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In John 1, 51. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open." And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Who? <laughs> angels. And I got, that's part one. I got part two notes here, but I won't get into that tonight. Everywhere in Scripture. One of the things that caught my attention was how connected prayer humbling ourselves and repentance in scripture was released was connected to the release of angels the prayer and the worship of Peter and John in prison the prayer of Daniel 
how often these the angels were released in direct connection to prayer and intercession. Whew. If we could just begin to understand how much God has cared for us. He even speaks in the book of Daniel of, of, Gabe, of, of Michael, the angel over Israel. It's Israel's, Michael is, is in charge of Israel. And that Michael, go back and read chapter 10, and you'll see. He said, Michael, Michael is not going to let you be destroyed. <laughs> Michael is fighting for you. <laughs> Woo. There's angels God gives us personally, but there's also angels God gives to us corporately. I believe even in regionally. Man, I heard this story. I'm ending with this. When I was a very young Christian, baby Christian, I went to a, brought to a Sunday school conference and a man was talking about prayer and he had this incredible vision. And in this vision, he was praying and as he was praying, these angels were warring. They were just, just fighting against the enemy and driving back. And then he would get a little tired and he'd stop praying. And when he stopped praying, they'd stop the enemy would advance. And then he started praying again, and the angels would fight. And then when he stopped praying, they would stop. I believe there is a divine connection between our prayers. And maybe that's one of the reasons why God has raised up the worldwide prayer, 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week prayer movement. There is a divine connection between prayer and the working of angels, which are here to strengthen us, to encourage us, to deliver things from God to us, to protect us, to fight for us, to hold us up, to even speak to us and give us instructions at times. Oh, yes, Father. Mm. In every area of your life, in your spiritual life, in spiritual warfare, but in your natural life, they even provided for his physical needs, Elijah's physical needs. Woo. Can angels go and clear the path for you on getting a job or provision? Yeah, sure. The enemy is fighting. He wants control. He wants to torment. He wants to bring lack. God has given his angels charge over us. Hallelujah. Father, make us sensitive to the spirit realm. And Father, let us be a people of prayer that expect heavenly divine intervention. We don't pray to angels. We pray to you, Father. But they are your ministering spirits. They are your ministers, servants unto us who are the heirs of salvation. We thank you, Father. You have not left us here alone. You have not left us if you not forsook us. You are with us right now, God. Father, fill our homes with, an, with angels. Uh, protect us in our dreams at night. Angels to guard us in the night, oh God. And Lord, we repent. We repent. Father, we repent right now. We, we as a church in America, we have sinned greatly against you. We have, we have presumed upon you and we have we've not honored you, God. We've not honored you with our words. We've not honored you with our lives. We've not honored you with our, 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 our giving, God, in so many areas. God, we've fallen so short. We've compromised, God. We've been fearful. But, oh, God, you established. You established your work, and you established this country. Let your name be great. Let your glory be manifested in America, that your name may be lifted up, that people may magnify and glorify you, oh, God. 
not for our glory but for your glory not for our sake but for the sake of your son Jesus Father Woo. Jesus Jesus Father I pray right now I, I declare and pray right now Father that you give everyone that's in this building tonight, everyone that's listening, God, everyone that's going to watch it, the hundreds and hundreds on Facebook and through the website, God, that you will give to them a new spiritual sensitivity. A new spiritual sensitivity, oh God. To the angelic realm, to the heavenly realm, to the spirit realm. And Father, that we can walk with the humble confidence that you have given your angels charge over us. You have given your angels charge to keep us in our ways. In Jesus' name.